Welcome back to CS520. In this session, I want to talk about implementing threads. The target architecture will be the Intel IA32. So what's our goal? Our goal is to provide the illusion of multiple threads executing when there is only a single processor. And with a single processor, there only can be one thing executing at a time, but we want to provide the illusion of having multiple threads going on at the same time. And we're going to have a very simple interface here, roughly based upon the POSIX thread interface. So there's a thread create function that takes a work function, a pointer to a work function, and a pointer to um, a data item that's going to be the single parameter passed to the work function. So again, the thread is being created to run this work function with that argument. Thread create should return a long which is some kind of thread ID, so that we can have other primitives to maybe manipulate that thread. I'm also going to look at implementing thread yield. This is a function where one thread can give up the processor and let another thread run. This is where the, the magic occurs. So, at this level, what is a thread? You know, what do we need to record to keep track of a thread? Well, a thread is a program counter, right? We have multiple threads executing. Each one has some notion of a program counter of where they are executing in the code. We have the other registers because there's only, if we have a single processor, we only have one set of registers and we're sharing that am among the threads. So we have to keep track of this thread's register contents. And then each thread is going to have to have its own stack. So I claim that's pretty much sums up everything you need to know about a thread. You know, where is it executing? What are its register values currently? And where is its stack? So when a thread is not running, we need to remember that information somewhere. You know, that's the thread state. And we have to remember this information somewhere. So I like to call uh, a data structure called a thread control block, the TCB, which contains thread state, a thread state when it is not running. And what we'll do is we'll keep a list of these TCBs for ready to run threads. Uh, and I'll call that the ready list. So every thread that is ready to run uh, will be in that queue. And the uh, thread control block, which is just a simple struct, uh, will have all the state for that thread. Uh, you know, you might be wondering why wouldn't a thread be ready to run? Well, you know, in a second lecture, I'll talk about implementing mutexes and um, condition variables, and those are cases where the thread might be blocked, and it won't be in the ready list at that point in time. By the way, my convention is going to be that the head of the ready list is the current running thread. So we always uh, know where the TCB is for the current running thread. It's at the head of the ready list. Okay, well, we're going to start with thread yield and understand how that works, and that will allow us to design and implement a thread create. Okay, so let's think about what thread yield has to do. Well, it's going to rotate TCBs on the ready list. You know, the first TCB is the currently running thread who called thread yield. So the first is going to be rotated around to become the last. Because um, our scheduling algorithm is here is just to uh, take turns. Um, who's going to run next would be the second one in the list then. So the first TCB gets rotated to be the end of the list, and the second TCB gets rotated up to be the first of the list. And thread yield, what does it have to do? It has to save the state of the running thread into its TCB. So it has to save the state of the running thread into its TCB and then restore the state of the next thread from its TCB. Sounds easy enough, right? In thread yield, we're going to change from running on one stack to running on another stack. And that will happen because when we restore the stack pointer, 
of the next thread, that's the magic moment when you change from running on one stack to running on a second stack. Okay, and this is why on the early lectures I said this course was so cool, because this is just cool stuff. Right, we are messing around with the registers in order to flip from running on one stack to running on a second stack. It's so one complication we need to deal with. Um, you know, we can create TCBs for threads that we create. In other words, for each thread that gets created by thread create, we have an opportunity in thread create to create a TCB. But our threading model, like POSIX threading model, is that we get one thread for free, right? The main thread is running at the beginning of the program, and we didn't get to create it, so we didn't get to create um, a TCB for it either. So we need a trick. We need to do the first time any of these thread primitives, thread create, thread yield, or anything else is called, we have to look around and see, have we created a TCB for main yet? If not, we create the TCB for main, and we make it the sole node on the ready list. If you think about it, if this is the first time a thread primitive is being called, there can only be one running thread, which is the original main thread. So we can create a TCP and put it on the ready list, which will be of length one at that time. So a little complication we have to deal with. Okay, the interesting part here, the tricky part here, is we have to save and restore thread state. To do this, we need to access the registers. So this code needs to be in assembly language so we can get access to the registers. So in my design, I'm envisioning an assembly language routine that has this C prototype. I'm going to call it ASM yield. So it's a helper function for the thread yield, the C code. And it's going to take two parameters. It's going to take the current TCB, it's really a pointer to the TCB of the current running thread, the thread at the head of the ready list and a pointer to the TCB for the thread that's going to run next. Which registers do we need to save? Well, I would claim we only need to save four. In this discussion, I'm ignoring the floating point registers. So we need to save the stack pointer clearly, because that's what is going to let us change stacks. And then we need to save the callee saved registers because the caller saved registers will be saved by the caller when they call uh, thread yield. So that will already be on the stack. I don't have to worry about it, but the three callees saved we need to save and restore. Um, you might be wondering, gee, why don't we save the EBP? Why don't we save the instruction pointer, the program counter? Well, you'll see when we work through this that we, don't, we won't need those. Those will actually be in the, in the stack so we'll save and restore them from the stack in sort of the usual manner. Okay, well, again, I'm talking about writing an assembly language routine that's going to access a struct, a C struct. So let's talk about how we write assembly language code to do that. You know, we have to think about the memory layout of the of the struct. So I'm envisioning a, uh, a TCB would have these six fields, right? The four registers that I need to save, a next pointer in order to link TCBs together on a ready list. And as we'll see later when we talk about thread create, we need to keep track of the base of the stack. By base, I mean um, when we create a thread, we're going to create a stack for it by malloc'ing the stack, and I, what I mean by this is the malloc return value for the stack, and that's what we all, we'll use it to free the stack when the thread is shutting down later. So we think about the memory layout. Those are all 32-bit values, so they're all going to be at, at offsets divisible by 4. So, uh, and the order here is arbitrary. Right? You just have to do something in your C program, write your struct in your C program, and then make sure you assign these offsets in your assembly language program accordingly. So if the fields appear in this order in my C code, then I can assign offsets to them here. And here's the kind of code I would be writing in assembly language, right? If I've loaded the, the pointer to the base of the struct into the register EAX, then I can access fields in the struct by notation like this. This one is, is 
accessing this fourth field, um, the EDI field, um, which is at offset 12. So I can save EDI into 12 off the EAX. Or vice versa, I can restore by moving from 12 off the EAX back into EDI. So that's the kind of code you would write in your uh, ASM yield function to save and restore state. Okay. So now here we go. Make sure you you know pause the video and make and get your blood sugar up to an appropriate level because this is the tricky part. Slide number nine. What I like to call the magic moment. So let's think about thread yield being called. You know, I've got the stack for the current thread here, and I've got the stack for the next thread over here. And how did we get here? We're going to have a bunch of user functions potentially down here in the stack. Again, I'm assuming the stack is growing from high memory at the bottom of the slide towards low memory at the top of the slide. Um, so the user code was here. At some point in time, the user called thread yield, and a frame got put on the stack for thread yield. Okay. Thread yield then did some work and then it got ready to call ASM yield. And, and to call ASM yield, it set up the two parameters. The next TCB was pushed onto the stack and the current TCB was pushed onto the stack so that we could access those registers from the ASM routine at 8 off the frame pointer and 12 off the frame pointer. So it's, it pushed this next TCB pointer, it pushed the current TCB pointer, then it called ASM yield which pushed the old instruction pointer, right, the return address back in thread yield. And like all good functions, it, it would, upon entry to ASM yield, it would save the frame pointer. So when ASM yield is up and running, we have a frame pointer pointing here. We have a stack pointer pointing there, right, because we're going to write ASM yield as a good Intel function. The arguments are going to be at 8 and 12 off the frame pointer in our ASM yield function. Okay. The interesting thing is we are going to yield to another thread, but what state is that thread in? It must have done a yield at some point in the past, which is why it's not running. So if you think about it, the stack for that next thread is going to have exactly the same setup, although the number of user frames may be different because they may be in a different part of the user program. But if you look at the top two frames on the stack, it's going to be identical. There's going to be a stack frame for thread yield, and there's going to be on top of that, there's going to be a stack frame for ASM yield. Okay, so that's the key point to think about and make sure you understand that these two are going to be in identical states. This one's shutting down, and this one was shut down in exactly the same way. So this is the picture when we're executing an ASM yield. Let's go up here and, and look at it. Right? I said ASM yield is going to be a good Intel function, so it saved the frame pointer and it set up the stack pointer. That's why we have them both pointing to a saved frame pointer here. Okay, and then there's a bunch of code where it's, it's handling the other registers, saving and restoring the other registers. And at the bottom of this function is going to be something like this. We're going to restore the stack pointer. Again, why did I do it like this? Let me flip back to my TCB design. My TCB design had the ESP. It's the first thing in the uh, ESP to be the first thing in the TCB. So it's at offset zero. So to restore ESP, it's just move along where EAX points. In other words, the zero offset here is not written move along from where the EAX register points and put that into the stack pointer. And that is the magic moment, right? Because why? That stack pointer was pointing here, and when we restore it, it points here. And that's really when we go from running this thread to running that thread. Okay? The pop long then pops this frame pointer off. Right, the frame pointer of the thread we're waking up. Okay, so this top word gets popped off, a frame pointer gets established, and then we do a return, and and return pulls this instruction pointer off. So now this is the waking up thread's instruction pointer, 
which puts it back executing at the bottom of thread yield. But I think you're probably, I'm sure you're right at the end of thread yield. So thread yield will then return right back into the user's code. And that's the magic moment, right? We switch stacks. We did these two instructions and we're back up and running in thread yield. And then thread yield does a return sequence and we're back running in the user's code right where right after they called thread yield. Okay, I'm, I'm just got to sit here and pause because it's just so amazing. You know, how can we do this? We can do this because we understand how the Intel hardware handles function calls in the stack. All right, so remember slide nine is the one you're going to want to come back and think about. Uh, that's where the magic moment occurs. All right, so that's thread yield. What about thread create? Now that we know how yield is going to work, let's walk our way through thread create. Um, again, thread create takes two parameters, a work function and um, a pointer, a parameter to be put, push, sorry, parameter to be passed to the work function. So what does thread create got to do? It's got to create a TCB and put it on the end of the ready list. That's that's the semantics I typically um, expect, right? That the, I'm going to create a t TCB, but it's going to have to wait its turn to run. It's not going to start running immediately. All right, so we're going to malloc a TCB and initialize it, put it on the end of the ready list. We're going to use malloc to also allocate a stack because we need a place for this. We need memory for this um, thread to use for its stack. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to save the base of that stack and the TCB so it can be freed later. The base of the stack, again, by that I mean the malloc return value. Then we're going to initialize a TCB and stack so that the thread will execute this function. This, again, is a little tricky. We're not going to set it up to, to just execute the work function. Instead, we're going to execute another function that we write as part of our thread library code called thread start. It's not callable directly by the user. It's only used by us. And what does it do? It takes two parameters. Again, it takes the work function and the info pointer, the parameter for the work function, as its two parameters. And what does it do? It calls the work function with the info parameter, and then it calls thread cleanup. So again, this is a little subterfuge in order to get a chance to clean up the thread when it's shutting down. Right? A thread shuts down after it executes the work function. So this, this subterfuge allows us to uh, slip a function call in here and allow us to clean up after the thread, So which means basically free up the TCB and free up the stack. Okay. By the way, what is the thread creates return value? I said it's supposed to be a thread ID. Well, I would recommend we just use the address of the TCB as the thread ID. I mean, we know that's a unique value unique to the thread. The user doesn't really know what it is, but they don't care. It's just a handle to them. Um, and that's what can serve as our thread ID if, as we, if we're going to add other thread primitives to manipulate this thread. Um, okay. Here comes another fairly tricky slide. How exactly do we initialize the TCB and the stack? Well, um, here's the stack. First tricky thing is we are going to um, call malloc to allocate it, and malloc is going to give us this low address. Um, but remember, the stack is going to grow from high down to low. So when we, we initialize the stack, we're actually going to initialize the other end of the stack because the stack is going to grow this way. Again, this malloc return value is what, what we're going to re remember in the TCB so we can clean up, free this stack later. OK, and we're going to initialize the bottom five words or really the top five words, depending on your perspective, because again, this is high memory down here, right? We we know the base address from malloc. We know the length because we, we're going to have to tell malloc how big a stack we want. So we can get down here and start filling in these five words. And uh, 
what we're going to do is we're going to take the work function pointer and the info pointer that, that are our parameters. Remember, we're talking about implementing thread create. So these are the parameters to our to our primitive. We're going to place them in the in these bottom two words here. We can, we can skip this word. By x here, I just mean garbage. I mean, if you're implementing this, you might put 0 in there or something that you'll recognize. But it doesn't matter, as we'll see what's in that word. And then we put the address of the thread start function here. And then another garbage word here, but notice that the ESP that we save into the new TCB points to that garbage word. Again, this seems mysterious, and it is a little tricky. So uh, let's walk through what's going to happen here. All right, that's the initialization. We allocate the stack, we fill in those three particular words, and we initialize the ESP slot of the TCB to point here. The other three registers in the TCB uh, doesn't matter what we put in there because the user really shouldn't be expecting any particular initial values in the registers. I, I recommend just putting zeros in there if you're implementing this. Okay. All right, let's go look at what happens to this initial configuration um, when we're executing ASM yield now. Right. Remember back to the you know think back about how thread yield works. At, at the very end of thread yield, we're doing this ASM yield, right? So we're we're yielding to the thread, the new thread. So the new thread has been created, put on the end of the TCB, and eventually moved up to, as, as second on the on the. Uh, so let me say that again. We we've created this thread. We've put its TCB on the end of the ready list. Eventually, this TCB moves to the be second place on the ready list, and the first thread yields to us for the first time. Right? We're waking up for the first time. So our stack looks like this. Our saved ESP looks like this. We're in, we're in a, ASM yield, and we, I should have put here on this slide, this line right here was to restore the stack pointer, right? So we restore the stack pointer, which means we flip from the, the thread that was running before to this thread, and the stack pointer now points here. Then we execute the pop long EBP. So we pop that garbage word off, this garbage word off, into the frame pointer. We do a return. The return pops the this word, which is the address of thread start, the thread start function, into the instruction pointer. So now thread start is going to start executing. Okay, and thread start is going to start executing, and the state of the bottom of the stack is going to look like this, right? We popped the top two words off. The stack pointer is now pointing to this garbage word with the work and info parameters underneath them. Okay, and now we're up and running in thread start. Thread start is written in C, but it'll be compiled into assembly language, and the compiler will create the, the standard boilerplate at the beginning of a function, right? It's going to push EBP, right? It's going to push EBP, which actually is, is a garbage word, right? It was this word that we popped. So this is actually going to be a garbage word. I'll just cross that out because it's actually a garbage word. It gets pushed back there. Then it moves the stack pointer to be the frame pointer to initialize the frame pointer to be here, so that when thread start is up and running, the frame pointer points to a garbage word. There's another garbage word underneath it, and then we have the work and info. But here's the nice thing, right? The work and info are exactly where we expect them to be, right? Work is the first parameter to thread start, and it's where we expect first parameters to be. We expect it to be eight off the frame pointer. Uh, the info pointer is the second parameter to thread start. We expect it to be where second parameters are, 12 off the frame pointer. Okay, let me go back and look at the C code that I wrote for thread start. All right, here's thread start. All right, it takes two parameters. This is going to be compiled into Intel Assembler. Right? And the compiler is going to expect that to be at 8 off the frame pointer and that one to be 12 off the frame pointer. And it's going to use those two values to do the function call. Well, we've initialized things so that, that the values that we want are in the right spot. So that compiled C code will do what we want. Again, I don't know. I get goosebumps. This is just great stuff. Again, very tricky slide. You'll probably want to come back and take a look at that a few times. Um, Right. 
just go back one more time just to emphasize this right we got things up and running so thread start can run the user's work function and that will it's off and running right when that returns then this thread cleanup function is going to be uh, called what's thread cleanup got to do well it's going to remove the TCB from the front of the ready list why is it going to be on the front of the ready list well thread cleanup the thread is finishing but it's still executing it's executing thread cleanup so it's it's TCB will be on the front of the ready list so we remove it from the ready list because thread cleanup is because the thread is dying right we're getting rid of it um, so um, we can remove it from the ready list we can free its stack remember the TCB is going to contain a pointer to the malloc return value for the stack so we can call free with that value we can free the TCB and then we can call the ASM yield function and it's a little bit of a trick because it's it's I'm gonna pass null for the first parameter and I have to write ASM yield then to be conditional if that first parameter is null I'm not saving state right the thread is dying I don't need to save its state I can I can do a comparison against zero for this first parameter and branch to the second half of the code which restores state from this TCB which is the next TCB on the uh, on the ready list okay and ASMU will wake up that thread and get it running and the thread that called cleanup is now gone right it's terminated because it no longer has a TCB on the ready list okay one little note here about freeing the stack. It's a little dangerous the way I've said this. Um, uh, I'm still executing on that stack. I don't really feel comfortable freeing that stack while I'm still executing on it. Because when you free something, we know that the storage allocator, malloc free system, will, will be writing a few things in, this, in that memory location in order to control future allocations. And I want to make sure, uh, I'm a little nervous about that, those writes destroying some value on the stack that I need um, so I would recommend that we uh, we defer the freeze of stacks by one call to uh, clean up we'll free this stack the next time thread cleanup executes so we, we, again we, inside our system we keep a global pointer to the to the next stack to be freed uh, then every every call to cleanup we free the last stack that that you know the, the stack for the last thread that terminated and we remember the stack pointer for the uh, thread that's terminating now so that we can free it on the next call so we just defer things so we never free a stack that we're actually executing on just to be safe all right well my heart's pumping um, but it's even more exciting to actually code this up and see it work. Um, it's a tough thing to do though because until you get everything right typically you just get seg faults. But once it works it's pretty exciting. Okay before I quit just one last slide. Um, you know you may not like the idea of having to call thread yield explicitly from user code so we can use preemptive scheduling and hide the calls to thread yield by asking the operating system to generate timer signals at regular intervals and we install a handler function for the signal that will be called by the signal mechanism automatically and that handler function itself will call thread yield so we can force user code essentially to call thread yield by having a handler function that when it's woken up by a regular signal timer signal will um, call thread yield so we sort of uh, you know again this is the illusion the programmer now has this total illusion that it cre they've created multiple threads and they're just taking turns running and it looks like there's multiple processors actually on the system um, this is tricky though and like everything else I guess in this lecture this is tricky because we have to be careful we have to disable the signal handler at critical points we don't want the handler to call thread yield if we're in the middle of creating a thread you know we're in the middle of breaking the links on the ready list rotating things around adding something to the end whatever we don't want thread yield to call and start doing similar items right it's it's uh, it's gonna 
corrupt our data structures. So when you go to add preemptive scheduling, you have to think hard about where the critical sections are in the code, and you have to disable the handler function, basically, in those sections. Okay. Now how do you disable a handler function? Well, typically, again, you have a static global. That's a status flag of whether we're handling uh, signals or not. So when the single handler wakes up, it checks that flag, and if we're in a critical section, it just returns without calling thread yield. Now, on the other hand, if it wakes up and we are not in a critical section, I'll go ahead and call thread yield. And again, in this way, we can provide the true illusion without the user having to call yield to having multiple threads running simultaneously, at least in the view of the programmer, even if there's only one processor. Okay, so that's implementing threads. Let me stop here.